When I was a freshman in college, I wanted to be an entrepreneur. And by the end of freshman year, I wanted to work for Goldman Sachs. But I was lucky enough to have a math professor who explained to me that in his generation, the smartest people didn't go to work for Goldman Sachs. They tried to go to the moon. And they did. And today, 40% of Harvard graduates join finance or consulting companies. And there are 10,000 hedge funds. Now, even though the stock market is really important, I don't believe that the right solution to this is to have the brightest people in the world competing against each other and basically all doing the exact same work. So the vision for Numerai was this. The next Einstein should work in physics, not finance. But he should be using Numerai on the weekend. <laughs> so what is this picture? This is a picture uh, of the desk of a person who works at NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab in Pasadena, California. Uh, he's a systems engineer, and he's working on a mission to Jupiter's moon, uh, Europa. It's called the Europa Clipper mission. Now, does anyone think the world would be better off if someone like this rocket scientist were to go and work for a hedge fund? Does anyone know? We want people like this to take us to the stars, right? So, but the stock market is a very important problem. If we reran American economic history without stock markets, uh, we would not be here today. So, so much of the American history is about the finance that allowed for technology uh, to, be, to be developed. So, we need to get the best and the smartest people, the most intelligence possible, to reach the stock market. And there's no way for this NASA rocket scientist to do that. So there are all these brilliant people, and they're trapped. They can't contribute intelligence to the stock market. But take a look at this. So if you're here earlier, this is actually a still from a Numerai video. It's not a galaxy. Uh, it's, it's actually a still from a video we made at Numerai. So this NASA rocket scientist is actually also a Numerai data scientist. Numerai is letting him get get us to Jupiter's moons, and it's also allowing him to contribute intelligence to the stock market. So how did we do this? What is Numerai? What we do is we take away all the barriers preventing intelligence from reaching the markets. That's it. So it's a really easy company. <laughs> we just have to do that, and then we achieve our mission. The problem is, the biggest barrier is data. So if you think that the internet has democratized access to financial data, you're wrong. Uh, you can get a bunch of data on Yahoo Finance, but that is not even remotely uh, the right kind of data you need to, to do a hedge fund. It's a, it's a mess. Um, you have very expensive data that's very messy and requires a whole bunch of financial domain knowledge to even begin to model. Basic data is about like half a million dollars a year. And it also comes from these data vendors that have like ancient 
technology uh, for data delivery. I actually recently was getting some data from a data vendor, and they mailed a CD-ROM with the data on it. This is a huge uh, firm. So this sucks. Um, and we, Numeri needed to solve this barrier most of all. So this is what the data on Numeri looks like. It's just like a table with a bunch of features and a target variable. But how, does Numeri able, how is Numeri able to give away data like this? Well, the first thing is the data is totally obfuscated. So we're able to give it away for free. And it's also extremely uh, regularized so that you can take this data and right away build a machine learning algorithm. Um, and you don't need to know any of the special financial domain knowledge to, um, to be able to get started. And so on Numeri, uh, everything's much easier because you can also get this data on over our API and not, not on CD-ROM. OK. So we've made this system. And it's set up to basically attract the best talent in the world. Because it's the place without the barriers. And I believe that one day, someone will make a narrow AI that's extremely good at predicting the stock market. And I want to be friends with that person. Because uh, they're going to do really well, and they're going to have a huge impact. So how do we be friends with that person? We give them, we give them data, and we make them an amazing platform uh, for them to submit predictions and control capital in the world economy. Uh, to explain how we're doing this, um, I want to invite up Anson Chu, Numerai's uh, VP of Engineering. Can you hear me all right? All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to, new, uh, welcome to ErasureCon. <laughs> As you all know, Numerai is a data science tournament, but it is not a one-off competition. Data scientists on Numerai are not predicting a holdout test set. They are predicting the live stock market. To prevent overfitting, data scientists have to stake on their predictions in order to earn from the prize pool. In other words, they must have skin in the game. We started in late 2015, and to date we have over 200,000 submissions, 50,000 stakes, and we've paid over $6 million out in payouts and counting. All of this would not be possible without our incredible community of data scientists. Truly, <laughs> it's truly amazing to see such a diverse and talented group of people come together and collaborate. I want to give a big shout out to all the data scientists here, a big shout out to Rocket Chat, everyone who's following there, and everyone else who just cannot be here today. Thank you. Thank you for all your hard work. Thank you for all your feedback and support. I'm so proud to be working with you guys, and I'm so honored to be part of this community. In October of 2017, Richard wrote a Medium article titled, Numerize Master Plan. At the time, I was still at Uber. I was working on some distributed and machine learning systems by day, playing around with Ethereum and Solidity by night. I'd heard about Numeri before, but I didn't really understand how it all worked. And it wasn't until I read the master plan that it all came together. And when it clicked, I was mind blown. And so I tweeted it out, and I got a grand total of one like. <laughs> this was the one like that I got. Uh, but it was enough. I joined the company a month later. Today, I want to share with you three quotes from the master plan. 
These three quotes underpin the long-term technical vision, mission, and strategy of the tournament. And so I think it's important for everyone here to understand what that is. This is our mission. Finance is the invisible machinery that drives modern day human progress. We believe that improving its efficiency is the highest leverage way for us to make a positive impact on society. And building an open API that any AI can use to control capital is the key to making that happen. This is our vision. This is the most important technical difference between Numerai and other data science tournaments. From day one, we understood that we couldn't achieve our vision alone. To leverage the full potential of AI, we needed the help from the broader community. And to keep up with ongoing research in AI, we needed this community to be incentivized to improve their models over time. Numerai can never run away with data scientists' models, and this is the fundamental basis of our ongoing relationship. This is our strategy. In order to manage all of the money in the world, we must build a system that is reliable. The AIs of this network must be connected permanently and always be available. The system must be general and flexible, able to price any asset in the market, be it equities, currencies, commodities, debt, or even real estate. The system must be fast, and able to respond in real time. And most importantly, the system must be unstoppable, censorship resistant, and free of any human bias. So how do we get there? How do we go from a website for people to an API for AIs? We start off by examining the weekly submission and staking process on our website. Passwords, CAPTCHA, 2FA, zip files, so many clicks, so much time wasted. If you're a NASA data scientist working hard during the week, this is not the manual process you want to go through on the weekends. The answer was clear. The answer was automation. The first thing we needed to automate is the weekly manual submission process. Our goal was to lower the marginal cost of this to zero. We looked into many different solutions ranging from third-party hosted notebooks to blockchain-based private computing frameworks, but none of them were quite production-ready or secure enough for our requirements. Remember, Numerai is not allowed to see the algorithms used to build these models. And further, not every data scientist out there is able to operate their own infrastructure. And so we built Numerai Compute. Numerai Compute is a powerful tool that helps data, science, data scientists set up fully automated submission workflows in the cloud. The Compute CLI uses Terraform and Docker to deploy these models to AWS. It then creates a lambda that listens for new data from Numerai. When new data is detected, the lambda spins up the Docker container, downloads the new data, runs the model, uploads the predictions back to Numerai, and all of this for less than a dollar a month in hosting fees. This is how you set it up. With these three lines, I just deployed the example model to my own AWS account. Easy. To swap in your own model, you just have to edit a single file. We currently support Python and R. The CLI runs on Mac, Linux, and Windows. And if you don't want to use AWS, you can swap in any other cloud provider you want, like Google, like GCP. Or you can run this on Raspberry Pi if you really wanted to, like one of our data scientists have. This is an absolute game changer, but we're not done here. The current implementation requires you to have a billing account with this cloud provider. The next step here is to abstract that away completely and provision compute resources directly on the blockchain. All of this code is open source, and we would love your contributions. We have great documentation on how to get started. We even have a video for complete beginners. But if you want to learn more about how to contribute, 
or if you just want to learn more about how this works, please come find our team later. We'd be happy to talk to you. With submissions fully automated, we turn our attention to the manual staking process. Since staking parameters are done on the blockchain, they're public. And so automating this, automating this was as simple as exposing it in, in the account settings. We call this feature auto-staking. You can set a fixed NMR or a percentage of your wallet balance to stake. And each week, we will automatically create that stake for you. A couple of months ago, we launched this feature, the simple feature in beta. Today, 50%, over 50% of our weekly stakes come from auto-stakers. But as much as we liked auto-staking, it didn't solve all of our problems. The feedback that we got from the community was this. Automation is great, but having full control over the stake is still necessary in order to maximize profit. Investigating this further, we realized what looked like a UX problem was actually an underlying issue with our incentive structure. We identified two main problems. Number one, each round started off with an auction. This auction determines which stakes are actually selected and which are simply returned. Which means this auction also determines the benchmark of the round, which means together that the level of difficulty of each round is actually different. Number two, each round has variable payouts. And in order to maximize long-term profits and to bankroll manage correctly, you need to keep a large portion of your NMR on the side unused at any given time. These two factors combined caused the emergence of a meta game on Numerai, this game called staking strategy. And while it's fun to think about this all, and we have even released our own detailed analysis and the game theoretical analysis on all the stuff that's going on here, it's ultimately a distraction from what we're trying to do. Staking is about rewarding data scientists for good performance. That's it. There shouldn't be a metagame. And so we set out to redesign staking from the ground up. What if there was no weekly auction? Every stake is to be selected, and the benchmark never changed. What if you only needed to stake a single time, and you can earn from your entire balance forever? And what if all of these payouts were automatically rolled into your stake and compounded over time? We call this project Staking 2.0 because we feel like this represents a completely new way of thinking about staking. Or rather, this is a way that you can not have to think about staking. Instead, you focus on the data science and you let the profits roll in. And since staking is such a core mechanic of the tournament, we had to change everything. The website, our backend, the smart, the smart contracts that we have in Ethereum. And this would have taken our team months to implement if it wasn't for this new protocol that just launched that allowed us to build all of this in a short amount of time in a secure, modular, and flexible way. Yes, this protocol is Erasure. And yes, we just rebuilt Numerai on Erasure. <laughs> if you're working at NASA during the week, this is what Numerai on the weekend should look like. A fully automated submission workflow a single continuous stake that compounds over time. This is a new chapter for Numerai's tournament and a big step towards our grander vision outlined in the master plan. I'm really happy to announce that all of this will be out in Q4 of this year. There hasn't been a better time to be a data scientist on Numerai, and there hasn't been a better time to create your own AI to control capital in the economy. Thank you, everyone. Back to you, Richard. Amazing. Anson's amazing. Uh, you guys should find time to talk to him. Um, so <clears throat> this is 
This is one of my, well, this is my favorite part of the presentation um, because I get to show you what is happening inside of Numerai. Uh, anyone can go into our website and download our data and read blog posts about Numerai, but we've never really shown you what, what we're seeing, right? You're looking at all the data totally obfuscated. So what are, what are we looking at? So I want to show you some back tests. So back tests are terrible. Uh, they have a really bad reputation because you can kind of make a back test look however you want it to look. So if I'm going to show you some back tests, I want to first explain why our back tests are super legit. Um, Back tests usually always go up, and uh, I just think we can do, I just think we needed a way to prevent our users from basically back test overfitting. And uh, what happens is, you know, you can just keep trying things, and uh, eventually you'll come up with a strategy which is like a false discovery. Okay. So how do we prevent overfitting. We do it in three ways. With blind holdout data. Um, so if you take a huge section of data and you leave it out and you call that your out of sample test, that's a much better way uh, of, 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 of doing this. But that's kind of what a backtest is. A backtest is an out of sample test, typically. But the problem is you get to look at it too many times. So on Numeri, the holdout data, no one can see it. And um, no one has access to the targets. So that's the first thing. The next thing is we take away all the feature variable names. So imagine you were looking at a set of training data, and you were someone who really liked value investing. Like you're a big fan of Warren Buffett, and you believe in you know, buying low PE ratios will, make, will be a good strategy. So you would just kind of force uh, your, your model to do that. But you can't see uh, any of these feature variable names on Numeri. The other thing is uh, blind target. So when you're looking at Numeri, you're modeling n a number between 0 and 1. Is 1 up? The stock's going up. Is 1 uh, no? Uh, is, is, zero, is 0 down? It doesn't really work that way. We've decided what the target is. And, uh, and we don't describe that to, to anyone else. So any back tests created on Numeri are blind. Maybe think about it like a double blind trial. Uh, that's the only way you can do real science. OK, so let's show you the first back test. So the first complaint I used to get when I was pitching Numeri to investors was that they said, yeah, the machine learning is kind of hype, and machine learning doesn't really matter, and the most important thing is to have good data. So let's look at the same data set, but use a linear regression, and then use a machine learning algorithm. So this would be a kind of test on whether linear regression, which is an old technology, uh, is better than, better than machine learning, or just as good. So you want to see that? <laughs> so here's linear regression. So if anyone in the audience is kind of like skeptical of hedge funds and think you know, the, the whole market's efficient, this is a graph you probably uh, like. It shows you that with a linear regression on a, this data set, you end up kind of making no money by the end of it. OK, so what about machine learning? So here's a basic machine learning model. Now, this is just a model I threw together in like a minute. It's like got 100, it's a 100 trees XG boost model. So it's basically a default parameter, simple machine learning model. And this is what it looks like. So do you want to invest in machine learning, or do you want to invest in a linear regression? Yes. <laughs> um, it's kind of a lot better. And um, it's not amazing, though. Um, but it's, so it's not magic, right? But it is a lot better. 
And it's no surprise because, like I said, linear regression is, is really old. It was actually invented in 1795 by Gauss. And when he invented it, he decided not to even publish it. He didn't think it was worthy of publication. So uh, pretty weird to me that there are hedge funds running linear regression today. Try run linear regression on Numeri, you're not going to win any money. OK. So <clears throat> we don't just trade this machine learning model, of course. We trade the meta model. This is the model created by all of the predictions from Numeri users put together. So we're ensembling all of the intelligence. Now, the thing I didn't know when I started Numeri was whether that would beat just us doing a machine learning model inside of the company. So let's take a look at how the Numeri users perform. So to be able to show this graph took three years. Um, it took three years of work by us to kind of get the system right, get the incentives right. And it took three years of work from our users um, to perfect their models. OK, so when we got to this stage, we were like, so the bad hedge funds are using linear regression. The better ones are using basic machine learning. And we can, we can beat those. OK, so that means for a given data set, we can outperform anyone else because we have access to all this intelligence. So at this point, we're just like, well, let's just add more data. If we have a machine that can turn data into money better than anyone else, let's just add more data. So these are the sharp ratios on the basic data. Sharp ratio is just a kind of risk-adjusted return, right? So you can see linear worse than machine learning, worse than meta model. But that's all just on one data set, so let's add more data. OK. You ready to see what happens? Yeah. Um, this is what it looks like. Did you expect a clap for a back test when you're on your way here? <laughs> um, so that's amazing. OK. So how does that do on a risk-adjusted risk return? What's the sharp ratio of this? <laughs> <laughs> so that's what happens when we add more data. And by the way, we can just keep adding more the rest for, for the next few decades. And um, it's just going to keep improving. Because we have this edge that no one else has, which is the Numeri data science community. So does the Numeri company make sense? Should we, should we keep going? Yes. Yeah. So <clears throat> I want to invite up Marcos. Uh, Marcos has a long introduction. <laughs> I'm actually just going to read this one. Um, he has two PhDs in financial economics and mathematical finance. Uh, he founded Guggen Guggenheim Partners' QIS team, where he managed $13 billion. He was the first head of machine learning at AQR, the largest quant hedge fund in the world. He wrote the book on financial machine learning. And he's the most read author in economics on SSRN. And this year, he received the Quant of the Year Award from the Journal of Portfolio Management. And we have one common. And uh, he recently became a scientific advisor to Numeri as we take it to the next stage. So I want to invite up Marcos. We're going to have a chat about backtests.
How are you? Very good. Thank you for having me. Good. Um, so obviously, you've been in this space a while. And what happened in your career is you started to get interested in, in machine learning. And I just wanted to know what that trans transition was like and whether you've also seen the kind of pushback that I've talked about where people are quite skeptical of machine learning. Yeah, <clears throat> I think uh, many of us in finance um, have gone through multiple stages as uh, the industry has become more sophisticated. And um, my opinion is that machine learning is just modern statistics. Machine learning is used by uh, every national laboratory in the world, and uh, the large majority of the uh, recent breakthroughs in science involve machine learning, whether it is in astrophysics, uh, biomedical research, material science, you name it. It's always machine learning behind it. So why shouldn't machine learning work in finance? Finance uh, is an extremely complex system that can only be modeled with sophisticated techniques. So I think it's a no-brainer uh, to realize that machine learning is the, the tool for the job. And does it work in finance? Um, the most successful hedge funds in history uh, utilize machine learning every day. When you think of uh, Renaissance technologies, DE Shaw to Sigma, PDT, TGS, Capital Fund Management, all extremely successful hedge funds in general, not only quant hedge funds, but just hedge funds. All of them are uh, utilizing machine learning every day. Um, apologies. Uh, in a recent uh, paper, uh, you were talking about the three paradigms of research, right? And so Numerai is doing something pretty unusual. Um, but I really like the way you separated the different approaches. Um, so maybe you can describe that paper. Yeah. So there are three fundamental paradigms of how to organize quantitative research. Uh, one is the silo approach, which is the traditional one, and the most common one. Essentially, it consists in a company hires multiple teams of researchers. These researchers do not work in a cooperative environment. They may share some resources, but in fact, they are competing with each other for capital within the firm. Um, some firms are successful at utilizing the silo approach, but as you can imagine, it's not very scalable. It also involves tremendous rotation of the teams. Then you have the second approach, which is the platform approach. In, in the platform approach, what you do is you offer a backtesting platform for people to develop investment strategies. Uh, these approach has some advantages, like uh, the, the researchers actually share data and share functionality, but it has a big caveat, right? Uh, and that's that, um, as you mentioned before, uh, it's very easy to overfit the backtest, and if you, do, if you allow for overfitting, once overfitting has taken place, it's extremely difficult to uh, prevent, to, to correct for that. And then you have the third approach, which is the tournament approach. The idea of the tournament approach is you take financial data, you prepare, with, with domain-specific knowledge, you prepare some um, features, you, 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 you um, engineer the features in a way that narrowly define a problem on which all researchers are going to work and cooperate, right? And the advantage of this is that by construction, you prevent back to overfitting. There is no possible back to overfitting because the data is obfuscated. The targets in the test set are never shared with the researchers. So the researcher is making submissions of models that they don't really know if they work in the test set. So by construction, uh, overfitting is, is prevented. There is a, an interesting thing where you could, there's selection bias that can happen in two ways. So um, you could, you could be back testing and, and then se select the best model from, the, from all the different versions. So that's a, that's a problem, because that's taking this false discovery. But inside of Numerai, we could also take the best user from the test set uh, and just trade that user, right? So why would that be a bad idea? 
Well, that would be a bad idea because once you are exposed to all the possible outcomes and, and, and choose the best performing out, uh, outcome in the, in the uh, test set, now that's a, um, the selection bias that occurs within the model selection, right? So, uh, uh, for instance, a tournament like Numeri is, is extremely good at preventing uh, selection bias by the researchers. Why? Because the targets are hidden. The, 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 research, the researchers never get access to the whys in the test set. Um, and then uh, the important is that the tournament organizers, in this case Numeri, control for selection bias within the firm. And that's something that is, uh, it, there, there are specific protocols to prevent that. A lot of people also talk in machine learning about deep learning and, uh, and, and also, uh, you know, the larger your, your data, the better, the better your models can do. And people are quite surprised when they come to Numeri and they download our data and it's, it's like a gigabyte. It's not very much. And um, maybe you can wonder, you know, can you really do that much with a gigabyte? Um, what do you think of that? I mean, do you think you, that you, you need a, more data is obviously still better in finance as well, but there is actually quite limited financial data versus, say, like, you know, the number of gigabytes of video there is in the world. Um, so I want to know if you had any thoughts on that. Yeah. Definitely, you can apply machine learning on a handful of observations, a few dozens, dozens of observations, right? Um, or even a few hundreds of observations. Uh, in this case, we are talking about hundreds of thousands of observations. So we cannot uh, classify or, or label a numerized data set as a small data set. It's a large data set, definitely uh, large enough for applying a wide range of machine learning algorithms. Um, uh, some people may try to apply deep learning. Deep learning is extremely data intensive, so that's where, uh, depending on how the uh, model is structured, it, it may be uh, too much uh, gunpowder. But definitely, um, for the kind of data sets that we are talking about, hundreds of thousands of data sets, there are many different examples of algorithms that um, should uh, not overfit in those cases. Let me explain something important. When we talk about overfitting, we have to differentiate between two kinds of overfitting. Test set overfitting, which is what we described before, selection bias, and train set overfitting. So people typically mix these two, but the two are completely different. One, one is related to, uh, to the train set, the other one is related to the test set. So what you just described, the case of someone applying a um, deep, uh, deep neural network on a, on a train set, well, there are procedures to prevent that kind of overfitting. In fact, machine learning, um, unlike classical methods, machine learning has three different approaches to prevent uh, train set overfitting. Number one, you can uh, regularize the problem, like lasso, rich regression, etc. does. Number two, you can apply ensemble methods, like uh, in, in, in the case that you showed before, gradient boost, uh, bugging algorithms, etc. And third, you can also um, um, resample the data, like in cross-validation. So what I'm saying is that uh, overfitting is not a feature of machine learning. Overfitting is the result of the misuse of machine learning algorithms. There is no excuse for anybody to overfit. Uh, these procedures, these, math these mathematical methods are very resilient to overfitting. Yeah, I th that's one thing I think about is, uh, you know, one reason you might use a, a naive model like a linear regression is because it has so few parameters, you're just solving the coefficients, um, that it's, it might be more unlikely to overfit than, say, a neural net. But it's, it's kind of like, because it's so dumb, it, it won't overfit. It's not really, um, and so it's way better to have a neural net or something like that, but then really control for overfitting and really take it seriously. Yes. It, it, it is true that a very simple model is hard to overfit on the train set, 
but it's any model is trivial to be overfit on the test set, meaning that I can take the simplest regression model and run millions of alternative specifications, all of them extremely simple, and guess what? One of them will have a sharp ratio of five, so there is no escape for uh, test set overfitting. Um, the fact that the model is simple does not reduce the probability of overfitting on the, on the test set. So machine learning, that, this is not a reason not to use machine learning. Right. Um, well, Marcus is gonna be here all day, I think. And if anyone, we have a lot of data scientists here from Numerai. If anyone has any questions, um, they, can, they can add them to uh, Slido, um, which I think, uh, so if you, go to, if you go to this website, you'll be able to add any questions you want. Um, and thanks for being here. And I know there's a lot of our users are a big fan of you, and they have your book. Um, and so we're actually going to be doing a book signing uh, where uh, part of the swag pack available at this conference contains your book. Uh, so get that book and get it signed by the author. Thank you for having me.